my name is Nadia Berkovich, and I'm the head of the Russian language. And I teach all levels of Russian um, language and literature seminar in translation in English. And it's an honor to introduce uh, Professor Emily Johnson from the University of Oklahoma, who traveled today from Oklahoma to come here. She's the author of her book. Her first book is titled House in Petersburg, Learned to Study Itself, The Idea of Russian Korean published by Penn State University Press in 2006. And it won both the Antiparov Prize for the Best Work on the City of St. Petersburg by a foreign author and the SCMLA Book Prize. Thank you, in Cultural Studies. What's it stand for? South Central Modern Language Association. Thank you. And um, for her book, um, Arseny Farmakov, Block Letters, published um, by Yale University Press, uh, which she translated, edited, and wrote an introduction. She received um, the American Association of Teachers of Slavic and East European Languages translation prize. I want to thank uh, my um, Russian Eurasian Student Association students, Emily, Emmy, Emmy McKebel, the president, uh, Henry Portoid, uh treasurer, or vice president. vice president, and Brandon Taylor, who's not here, who submitted the budget to invite um, Professor Emily Johnson. And um, so thank you for your work and making the questions. Um, so this event is supported by the student activities fee as a funded event by the Associated Student Government. So it's actually paid by your student fees. So and today's uh, lecture is titled Block Let Letters as a Window on Soviet Private Life in the Stalin period. So please welcome Professor Emily Johnson. Thank you very much. I want to start by thanking Nadia for having me here and um, your wonderful Russian Eurasian Student Association for making me feel so welcome today. It's really a thrill to visit your beautiful campus and to see your wonderful Russian program. Um, I am recovering from a bit of a, a, a flu, as you may be hearing, so if I start um, coughing, you will excuse me. If I can't project as well as I normally would, feel free to move forward if you can't hear me. Um, I am always better at reading talks than I am just delivering them impromptu. That scares me. So you will see me with a giant wad of papers up here. Um, feel free to interrupt me if you want to ask a question. That's totally fine. Okay, so um, in the summer of 1940, the Soviet Union, emboldened by a secret diplomatic protocol that its leaders had signed with Hitler, invaded and forcibly annexed the Baltic countries of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, as well as the eastern half of Poland. Right? Stalin and Hitler famously divided up Eastern Europe, and this was Stalin's big, big grab. Right? Arrests soon followed in these areas that the Soviet Union occupied. Anyone with ties to what the Soviet secret police deemed anti-Soviet organizations Anyone who had ever expressed anti-Soviet opinions, veteran local political figures, civil organizers, and intellectuals, tens of thousands of people were seized and dispatched to labor camps or internal exile in the distant reaches of the Soviet Union. Or in some cases, they were simply executed. In Daugavpils, um, which you can see on this map here, it's the it used to be called Dvinsk. It's a historically very Russian uh, city, second largest city in Latvia. Um, one of the first people arrested during the Soviet purge was the owner and primary reporter for the local Russian language newspaper, a man by the name of Arseny Formakov. You can see him here, right? Uh, Formakov attracted the attention of Soviet secret police because of his status as a community leader in addition to owning and running one of the most important Russian language newspapers in Latvia, he had held leadership positions in his church, on the Daugavpils City Council, and in a variety of social organizations for Latvia's large Russian minority population. 
He had also authored two novels and a substantial number of newspaper articles in the 1920s and the 1930s who were obviously anti-Soviet in their tendencies. Arrested on July 30, 1940, just days after Latvia was officially incorporated into the Soviet Union, Formakov was held for almost six months in solitary confinement in the Daugavpils prison before he was even called in for an interrogation. Already substantially weakened and worried about the fate of his family by the time he saw an investigator, Formakov was quickly manipulated into signing a full confession. His investigator let Formakov catch a glimpse of his wife in the lobby as he was being moved into the investigation room and made it very clear that if Formakov did not quickly sign, she would be arrested too. She had been pregnant with a second uh, child at the time of Formakov's arrest and he had had no word during the six months he was in prison as to whether that baby had been successfully delivered or as to how she was doing with the older boy who was five. The investigator promised that Formakov could see his wife if he just acknowledged his crimes against the Soviet state and suggested that he would be able to retract the statement when the case went to court. In fact, there never was a trial. Instead, after more months in city jail, Formakov was simply told that he had received an eight-year sentence to hard labor this was typical for Soviet practices in the 30s, right, in the 40s. And then on, and on June 24th, 1941, two days after the Nazis launched a surprise attack on the Soviet Union, invading their one-time friends, right, he was loaded into a cattle car and sent to a labor camp in Siberia. Now, if I told you he was lucky right at this moment in the story, you might think I'm crazy, but he was, because actually they simply shot a lot of the prisoners they were holding at that time, um, infamously, in all the Baltics and in Ukraine, leaving behind scenes of carnage, with the Nazis then used to, with great effect, as propaganda throughout the war. Look what the Soviets did in these areas, right? Formakov spent the war years in labor camps in the Krasnoyarsk area, um, these are just sli slides of contemporary ruins. Although he worked outside in punishing logging details during some periods of time, for the most part he succeeded in getting jobs that kept him indoors, which gave him a far better chance of survival. His status as an invalid, he had a heart condition, and his willingness to contribute to voluntary cultural and educational work in camp helped him to secure these work assignments. Formakov wrote poetry for the Camp Wall newspaper and helped stage theatrical shows designed to encourage inmates to work harder and accept the basic tenets of Soviet ideology, all of which got him extra food, better living conditions, and just maybe the chance to live long enough to learn the fate of the loved ones he'd left behind in Latvia. From June 1941 until November 1944, Formakov had no word from his family. When the Red Army began reconquering Latvia in summer 1944, he had begun sending letters to every address he could remember. Um, his memory was a bit weak because of poor nutrition by this point. But for months he had no response. Where was his wife? Had his children lived? Finally, in late 1944, an acquaintance noticed a letter that he had sent general delivery to the Dalga Pills post office, which was lying in a pile of uncollected mail, and bravely decided to take it and write a response. This acquaintance told him that his wife was living in Riga with her parents and gave him the address. Communication was swiftly reestablished, right? And between the end of 1944 and the end of 1947, when Formakov is finally released from the labor camps, he, um, and allowed to go home to his family, he sends home dozens of letters, these are just some slides, postcards, telegrams, as well as many meticulously crafted greeting cards, um, illustrated stories for his children, books of poetry for his wife, and even small amounts of money and gifts. Most of the letters that Formakov sent home between 1944 and 1947 have survived and are now in the Hoover Institution archive. 
They are, for the most part, cautious documents, even when he managed to send letters to his family illicitly, evading the official camp censorship system, right, Formikoff, and mail system. Formikoff does not describe the full horror of the labor camp world he inhabited. He notes the chronic hunger, the symptoms of nutritional deficiencies, um, abscesses on his legs, teeth falling out, sore gums, um, work-related injuries, but he does not describe the threat of beatings from guards, punishment cells, and the other horrors that labor camp survivors like Solzhenitsyn would document after Stalin's death. Given how guarded they almost always are, what do examples of prisoner correspondence from the Stalin period, like these former cough letters, really have to tell us? They do not reveal the full horror of the labor camp system. So what exactly can they teach us? In my talk today, I hope to answer this question by talking about the Formikov correspondence and also about another example of prisoner correspondence from approximately the same period, the Lazut and Beskadarnaya letters, which are part of the collection of the Moscow Memorial Society, a prominent NGO that focuses on human rights and the legacy of the Soviet labor camp system. I hope to show you today that even though they are very guarded and heavily censored, labor camp correspondences can highlight some very important aspects of Soviet private life, and specifically about the relationship between the world of the camps and Soviet society outside. In thinking about Soviet life, we often perceive both Soviet citizens and living conditions in very black and white terms. We think of Soviet spouses either completely cutting off and denouncing their arrested husbands, or heroically remaining loyal and steadfast despite all the pressure. We assume prisoners either caved to official pressure and became informants or resisted, again heroically, firm in their anti-Soviet convictions. We believe that inmates in Soviet labor camps were always materially worse off than their relations outside the world of the camps, and that both inmates and their relatives would have understood this. In fact, however, both human relationships and basic aspects of life in the Soviet Union were often much more ambiguous and complicated than such reductive approaches to understanding Soviet society would suggest. Both the Formikov and the Lazut and Beskadarne correspondences <coughs> me, show us a world in which choices and decisions were often much less clear, a world where a spouse might divorce and yet continue to write to a prisoner, where a prisoner could at once seemingly with real enthusiasm, espouse loyalty to the Soviet state, and even sign on to serve as an informant, and yet also simultaneously continue to celebrate religious holidays, which is a no-no in the Soviet Union, and write poems about the pillaging of Latvia by Soviet invaders. They show us a world in which care packages were mailed out of labor camps as well as into them. Uh, before showing you some examples of such phenomena from the Formikov and the Lazuts and the Alskadarne correspondences, I think, however, that I should say uh, just a few words about the mail, how the mail service operated in Soviet labor camps during the Stalinist period and uh, prisoner correspondence in general. Okay? Um, although many of the best known accounts of life in the Stalin era labor camps and prisons depict Soviet penal institutions as almost entirely cut off from the outside world. In fact, most prisoners theoretically enjoyed the right to correspond with close family members, at least occasionally. As a rule, prisoners could neither send nor receive written communications while their cases were under investigation. But once they had received their sentences, they could begin corresponding with their loved ones um, provided they could get access to paper and writing influence, which was no small feat. In practice, this meant that prisoners generally mailed their first letters home, either from a transit camp or upon arrival at a permanent place of confinement, rather than from the investigative prisons in which they were initially held. Rules regarding how often prisoners could send and receive letters varied over time and from place to place. Often prisoners could receive an unlimited 
number of letters, telegrams, and packages, but in theory at least faced restrictions on how frequently they could reply based on their sentences, with those convicted of political offenses in the most restricted category. Um, they might be limited to sending as few as two letters a year. In camps with a mixed inmate population, however, administrators struggled to maintain such distinctions. High turnover among the population of inmates, overcrowding, and poor staffing in camps made it difficult to keep prisoners and their documents together or segregate the incarcerated according to their sentences. In many places, prisoners in restricted categories managed to send mail out through the official camp mail system far more frequently than the rules allowed. Inmates also often found opportunities to dispatch additional correspondence covertly through free laborers or through prisoners trusted to move around outside the camp without a guard. Some political offenders managed to send out hundreds of letters a year through a combination of legal and illegal channels. World War II, of course, disrupted communication. When the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union in June 1941, prisoners were initially restricted from having any communication with loved ones. Within eight months, this absolute ban had eased and prisoners could once again correspond. Nonetheless, the rapid Nazi advance meant that many prisoners, like Formakov, were entirely cut off from their relations. The Soviet mail system stopped at the Soviet front lines. There was no way to get mail into or out of German-occupied territory. Prisoners could only wonder where their families were and whether or not they lived. Since reports of Nazi atrocities in occupied territory appeared regularly in the Soviet press, waiting for news was painful, and new arrivals in camps could expect to be grilled for information by fellow arrestees. Both the communicative exchanges I will discuss here today date to the years of the Soviet Union's involvement in World War II and the famine-plagued post-war reconstruction period, roughly 1945 to 1948. Letters from these periods provide particularly interesting examples of the way in which information and goods circulated between inmates in the camps and their relations on the outside because conditions were so extreme. The rapid German advance in 1941 left vast swathes of Soviet territory under enemy control. Mass military and civilian casualties, dislocation and destruction, desperate shortages of basic necessities, draconian work rules, and rationing left many free Soviet citizens in horrifying circumstances. At the same time, conditions in Soviet labor camps deteriorated. The war exacerbated pre-existing supply problems, further reducing the access of prisoners to food, clothing, and other necessities. Mortality rates in the camp soared to such highs that even the central authorities recognized the situation as a problem. In early spring 1942, the People's Commissariat of Internal Affairs ordered camp and prison commandants to encourage prisoners to write home and ask for care packages to supplement dwindling allocations. Throughout the rest of the war and the post-war reconstruction period, um, the packages that individual prisoners received from their re relations represented an important, officially acknowledged secondary line of supply for places of confinement. The NKVD, the Ministry of Internal Affairs, required prisons and camps to track the number of private packages that arrived and also the amount of food and clothing that entered the penal system through this mechanism. Prisoner correspondence during the war years also underwent new forms of censorship. In addition to being reviewed by the camp censorship department and potentially by secret censorship offices that operated out of ordinary Soviet post offices, Letters were now reviewed also by military censors who were likely to black out anything that they deemed defeatist or potentially demoralizing, i.e. reports of bad conditions. Prisoners also engaged in self-censorship, right? Partly out of fear, but also because it seemed pointless to cause worry and distress when there was nothing that the other party could do about it. Why reveal the full horror of the situation 
if the other person can't help you. In other words, even if they received communications from each other regularly, right, prisoners and their families did not necessarily have a full sense of their respective experiences in this period. They made choices based on partial information, drawn from rumor and hearsay, and by reading between the lines. The correspondence of Arseny Formakov provides excellent examples of the ambiguities involved in reading Soviet prisoner correspondence. Who exactly was Formakov um, by the time he began exchanging mail with his wife and children in late 1944? When he was arrested in summer 1940, Formakov had been a comfortable member of Latvia's bourgeoisie. In addition to his newspaper, he owned two apartment buildings, which he had inherited from his grandmother, a summer cottage in a popular resort area, and other property. Born into a community of traditionalist Russian Orthodox Christians, known as Old Believers, it, it, it had been in existence in Latvia since the 18th century, he had attended religious observances and marked church holidays with elaborate rituals and prayer since his childhood. He also, however, enjoyed more secular pastimes, such as theater, opera, and cabaret performances. Although proud of the Russian culture that he considered his birthright, he was also an enthusiastic citizen of Latvia, a country he viewed as a bulwark against Bolshevism, and a sanctuary in which pre-revolutionary Russian culture could be preserved free from Soviet influences. By late 1944, he seems in some ways a changed man. Steeped for three and a half years in Bolshevik ideology, thanks to his involvement in the work of the camp cultural education sector, for which in the 1940s, Sovietizing inmates from newly conquered stretches of territory like the Baltics represented a priority, right? He can wield official political slogans and phrases drawn from uh, uh, the speeches of Soviet leaders with great aplomb. In letters, he enthusiastically extols the liberation of Latvia from the accursed invaders by our valiant Red Army and entrusts his children's future to the great Russian people about whom Stalin spoke so well at the reception of the commanders in the Kremlin Palace. He speaks of being moved by the classics of socialist realism and recalls the witty verses he wrote for performances at neighboring state farms that called out the lazy and non-compliant by name. Although some of these expressions of orthodoxy seem born out of fear or self-interest, others ring with seeming sincerity suggesting that perhaps Formakov had, to some extent at least, been successfully re-educated in camp. Indeed, Formakov's secret police file in Latvia suggests that by 1945, he had joined the official roles as an informant in camp. Although it is hard to know how much useful information he gave camp security officers, the fact that he remained largely in good work assignments while in camp and was allowed to return to Riga after his release in 1947, suggests that he probably provided at least some information. Usually prisoners were not allowed to return to capital cities like Riga. Right? So Formakov was re-educated in camp and became an Orthodox Soviet believer during his stay right, in the labor camps. Maybe. But other passages in the letters present a very different view of the man. You see here a handmade Easter greeting, the ribbon on the small bouquet of flowers, which you won't be able to read um, from so far away, actually reads, Christ is arisen, the ritual greeting that Russian Orthodox believers and old believers give to each other for Easter, right? In his letters, Formakov meticulously records his efforts to celebrate church holidays and camp with pussy willows mailed from home, substitute cakes made out of bread and salt as opposed to traditional sweetened mixtures and elaborate prayer rituals. In an illicit letter sent home to his wife, he carefully explains that the poem he wrote describing the sacking of Rome by the barbarians 
should be understood as a comment on, quote unquote, what happened in 1940, i.e. the Soviet invasion of Latvia. Although it was often understood, he goes on to note, when he read it in camp at official cultural sector events, as a description of the German invasion of the Soviet Union. He sends home watercolors of Latvian cityscapes and talks about longing for home, the longing for home that he felt when he heard that Latvian regiments were being called up to fight the Germans. So what do we make of Formakov? Was he truly reforged in camp? And did he begin uh, to think as well as speak Bolshevik? Or was his re-education a more superficial and opportunistic affair that primarily reflects his entirely understandable desire to live and return home to his family. Was he sincere when he expressed religious uh, uh, sentiments or obsequiously mouthed Soviet slogans? Or are we, when we try to examine the issue of sincerity in a case like Formakov's, asking entirely the wrong question? Can we perhaps see Formakov's life and specifically the shifts in register in his labor camp letters as evidence that the communicative landscape in um, late Stalin-era Soviet Union, even at its most seemingly controlled manifestation, a labor camp, was really less monolithic than is often suggested and allowed for something that almost resembles code switching, seemingly abrupt changes of ideological perspective depending on the context, interlocutor, and perhaps even the speaker's mood. Did the lives of new Soviet citizens from the Western hinterlands undergoing Sovietization always take the form of neat conversion narratives? And their speech show a clear progression to greater and greater conformity? Or was reality often somewhat grayer and less consistent, punctuated with backsliding, bad moods, born out of frustration, and bouts of retrograde thinking? Perhaps sometimes just because the social situation or the interlocutor seemed to require it. For Formakov, writing home in 1944 would invariably have meant re-engaging with his pre-arrest past. His relationship with his wife and son had taken place in the world of uh, uh, bourgeois pre-invasion Latvia. Is it so surprising that he often slips back into patterns of selfhood and communication associated with the bourgeois world in the letters he sends home? In the behavior of Formakov's wife, as documented in Formakov's labor camp letters, we see a different but equally telling example of a nuanced response to Soviet ideological and social pressure. After his release from camp in 1947, Formakov spent two years home in Riga with his family before he was picked up again in 1949 on trumped up charges and given another 10 year sentence. During his second labor camp term, Formakov's wife divorced him, right? Um, she was told that she was at risk of losing her job if she did not do so. Um, he received an official notification in camp. He was called into the camp home and son's office and told your wife has divorced you with no advance notice. Um, he wept. For all intents and purposes, this was a real thing. And yet, by 1942, Formakov's spouse has resumed writing to him under both her mother's and her sister's names, and is sending him carefully prepared packages, despite her own limited financial resources. When he was released from camp a second time in 1955, following Stalin's death, she remarries him. Labor camp correspondences and other documents from the home archives of individual Soviet families are valuable precisely because they show that such nuanced and unpredictable responses to official pressure were very possible. Soviet citizens did not just make a single permanent decision to conform to state demands or reject them. They navigated a complex world with that demanded daily choices. And like all of us, they might compromise, change their minds, and engage, particularly over a spread of years, in seemingly contradictory behavior. In some situations, they might play the role of loyal servants of the regime, and in others, adopt strikingly different patterns of behavior, sometimes at considerable risk for themselves. The Formakov correspondence shows how hard it can be when Stalin, studying the Stalin period to neatly divide loyalists and dissenters into tidy and mutually exclusive categories, 
and to predict what someone will do based on past behavior. So, I have less slides for this lesson than the illustration. The letters of Pyotr Lazutin um, that he exchanged with his fiancée, Raisa Beskodarnaya, between February 1945 and May 1946 represent a remarkable extended example of correspondence between a prisoner and a former detainee. Although inmates released from the camps in the Stalin period did sometimes send back letters to friends in places of confinement, um, both correspondence rules and fear tended to limit the duration of such exchanges. Rules were not always enforced, but theoretically prisoners could only correspond with immediate family members. Realises, moreover, knew that efforts to sustain contact with other convicted criminals, including political criminals, particularly political criminals, could only increase their chances of rearrest. The Lazut and Gaskadarna exchange also merits attention for another reason. It shows that even in instances when a prisoner's loved ones had personal knowledge of the camp system and fully understood the conditions the prisoners faced, they might not necessarily have perceived their own situation as superior to an inmate's. Material resources and sympathy could flow from the camps to the outside in a way that defies our expectations. Piotr Lazutin and Larissa Beskodarna met when both were serving terms in the Intinsky coal mining camp in the Komi Autonomous Region. Lazutin, an electrical engineer by training and a party member since 1930, had enjoyed a successful career in government service. At the time of his arrest in Moscow in December 1940, he occupied the post of assistant head of the international section of the Ministry of Communications. Convicted under Article 58 of the Criminal Code for Treason and given a five-year sentence, he performed hard labor in the mines when he first arrived in Inta. After being injured in an accident, however, he was transferred to a workshop above ground and allowed to perform work more suited to his specialization. He repaired electrical equipment needed for mining operations. Um, this relatively light work assignment doubtless saved his life. He remained indoors much of the day and had better access to resources. Bess Kodarnaya, his fiancée, arrived in Inta in March of 1943 as part of a party of young women, all of whom had received five-year sentences for skipping or arriving late at work under a June 26, 1940 decree to tighten labor discipline. A native of Perm, yeah, that's a scary one for those of you coming late to class or to you, <laughs> right? Um, renamed Molotov from 1940 to 1947. She was only 18 when she arrived in camp, a full 20 years younger than Lazutin. She had completed just seven grades in school and had relatively little cultural sophistication. But despite the obvious differences in their backgrounds, Lazutin and Veska Darnay quickly grew close. By the end of 1944, they were engaged. In summer 1945, a general amnesty for inmates convicted under the decree that punished you for being late to work um, was announced and Beskodarnaya was released. As soon as she could, she left to rejoin her siblings and mother in Molotov with the intention of reuniting with Lazutin when his sentence ended. For the next year, Lazutin and Beskodarnaya corresponded regularly over 50 letters <coughs> that the pair exchanged between August 1945 and June 1946 survive in the archives of the Moscow branch of Memorial. Moreover, internal evidence uh, suggests that there were more letters and that some of them just weren't preserved. Um, uh, the total number of letters that they sent was probably considerably higher. Um, some of the letters that they exchanged clearly bypassed the official camp postal system and censorship, uh, presumably with the help of free laborers in the Inta camp. Other letters, however, most likely passed officially. They bear the distinctive stamps of the camp censors, these little land stamps, and or are addressed to the post office box used for officially regulated camp correspondence. Even the first letters that Beskodarna has sent back to Lazutin from Molotov express her considerable disappointment in her situation. The supply situation in the city was poor, and her family was destitute. Her mother had no job, 
Her brother earned a pittance working at a local factory. They had already sold essentially all the family's spare possessions to buy food for themselves or so that they could send Beskadarnaya packages while she was in camp. They did not have access to the specially regulated stores that sold um, uh, essential foodstuffs at regulated prices and had to purchase everything that they needed at the bazaar at inflated prices. Although Beskadarnaya managed to find work as a typist in a textile factory, she noted to Lazutin that her salary of 250 rubles a month did not even allow her to purchase bread. She subsisted on the dinner that she got with her ration coupons. In a letter dated September 13, 1945, she writes, you need to understand what our material circumstances are like now. You can't imagine how it is. I never experienced anything like this before, at least not before the camps. But this is home. After everything I had been through, could I have possibly thought that it would be like this? Not realizing how things were, I wanted something different. I dreamed. I imagined freedom entirely differently. I did not expect to find things this way. Clothing represented a particularly pressing concern for Beskadarna. Nothing remained from her pre-arrest wardrobe. She had left camp with little and had no winter coat and no real shoes. With no clear way to improve her circumstances in Molotov, she quickly began to regret her decision to leave in Tal. As a free laborer in the camp, she noted, in a letter dated September 27, 1945, she would have lived better and might have even been able to help her family financially. Lazutin responded to Beskadarnaya's unhappy description of life in Molotov with lengthy, sympathetic letters. He agreed that Beskadarnaya's decision to leave in Tal had been a terrible mistake and noted specifically the role that family correspondence had played in nudging her towards this short-sighted decision. Your mother, he writes in one letter, really let us down. She didn't write about anything, and you thought everything was just fine. Lesutin promised that if Beskadarna managed to get permission to return to Inta, he would do everything he could to assist her in getting reestablished. Beskadarna, however, demurred that she could not go back without serviceable winter clothing. Moreover, she felt uncomfortable going to join a person who was still not free and who himself needed support and assistance. Interestingly enough, for all the student may have regretted the fact that Beskadarnaya's mother had not spoken frankly about conditions in Molotov in the letters that she mailed into the camps, he himself urged his fiancée to censor herself when writing back to the friends she had made in Inta. In one letter he notes, I advise you not to tell them about the prices at the farmer's markets and your hardships. Don't forget that this is a camp, and you shouldn't include all sorts of foolishness when you write here, because that sort of thing will only lead to trouble, first of all, for you. I hope you understand what I mean. In December 1945, at least in part as a result of her difficult financial circumstances, Beskadarna left Molotov at her mother's urging and went to visit relatives in Ukraine. She got stuck in Moscow on the way and, finding herself short on both food and money, began to mail letters to Lazut and Caron delivery, so he had to pay the postage. Although when she reached the home of her aunt and uncle in Kunashovka, Ukraine, she found material conditions there on balance better than they had been in Molotov, she continued regularly sending Lazutin unstamped mail, so he paid the postage. Initially, she delayed looking for work because she thought it might be difficult for her to get permission to quit if she later wanted to leave and return to Lazutin in Inta. When she finally did get a job, she found herself learning so, earning so little that she again could hardly cover her basic expenses. In March 1946, Lazutin responded to Beskadarnay's continued accounts of her straightened circumstances by sending her 500 rubles. Approximately a month's pay in the period for an average Soviet employee. In the thank you letter Vyaskodarna sent Lazutin in response, she herself called attention to the incongruity of the situation and emphasized the magnitude of the gift. She was accepting material aid from a political inmate. But then, as she noted in an effort to justify herself, her material circumstances were no better than his were. 
In fact, this was not the first time Lazudin had tried to send his fiancée funds. He notes in letters that he first tried to send a wire transfer of 450 rubles to her when she was in Molotov, but she had left by the time the money arrived and the funds returned to him. He then tried to wire the cash to her in Moscow, but again just missed her. He also made steps to resolve her clothing situation. He writes in one letter, I have a coat for you. You just need to get it re-sewn into a woman's style. Lazutin's letters to Veskodarnaya make it clear that all this assistance involved considerable sacrifice on his part. Regarding the 500 ruble transfer, he notes specifically, these are all the savings that I had. In another letter, he writes, I am alive and healthy and have lost a noticeable amount of, late, uh, of weight lately. How could it be otherwise? I worry so much about you. Nor was Veskodarnaya herself complacent about Lazutin's health and situation. In one letter she writes, I think about you often, far too often. You never leave my mind. Recently I had a dream about you in which you were sick. You looked awful. I woke up in the middle of the night feeling wretched. I was terrified that something might have happened to you. Are you well? What should we make of this improbable exchange? Why would a Gulag inmate send such a substantial sum to a loved one? And why, moreover, would living conditions outside the camps emerge as the chief point of concern in the correspondence? To some extent, doubtless, gender roles represent a factor. Throughout the exchange, Lasutin expresses anxiety about Gaskadarnaya's loyalty and commitment to the relationship. Any interruption in the correspondence tended to exacerbate these fears which, moreover, to some extent, appear to have been justified. Surviving letters suggest that Veskodarnaya wrote to Lazutin and told him that her relatives had questioned the wisdom of their relationship. Given this challenge to the relationship, it makes sense that Lazutin would want to prove himself as a provider to show that even in the most difficult circumstances, he could extend himself and make sacrifices on her behalf. His relatively privileged work assignment in the camps and contacts with free laborers, the fact that he maintained some ties with family and probably received wire transfers from home, as well as small monetary payments that convicts collected for their labor in the post-war period in the camps, all helped make it possible for him to pay this role. One might also perhaps reasonably note that tolerance for deprivation varies and suggests that Gaz Kadarnaya's willingness to accept Assistance from Lazutin reveals a certain callousness. It seems worth noting, however, that their relationship survived the challenges they faced and by most measures must count as tremendously successful. After Lazutin's term ended in 1946, Beskodarne returned as promised to Inta to rejoin him. They married and went on to have two daughters. When Lazutin donated the couple's correspondence to the archive, of the Moscow branch of Memorial, he submitted it with a loving two-page explanatory note that charted the course of their relationship. Pressed flowers are interspersed among the letters. Overall, the Lazut and Gaspadarne correspondence reads as a telling comment on the realities that defined Soviet life during the Stalin period. Food and clothing were in such short supply that in respect to at least access to these goods, the lives of many free Soviet citizens did, differed little from those of Gulag inmates, particularly in certain periods and places. Individuals whose loyalty to the system seemed suspect, including both relations of those sentenced for counter-revolutionary activity and those who had themselves spent time in exile in the camps, faced barriers to employment that made surviving periods of acute uh, shortage, such as the famine years that followed World War II, doubly difficult. Moreover, living conditions within the camp system also varied. An inmate like Lazutin, uh, who was relatively fortunate in his work assignment um, uh, and in the camp in which he was held, might indeed find himself at least temporarily better off than his loved ones. Although the size of the transfer that Lazutin sent Veskodarne is striking, the fact that he sent money hardly counts as exceptional. Surviving examples of Gulag correspondence often mention small transfers of funds or packages sent home from the camps. Inmates wanted desperately to remain connected and to continue to play an active role in the lives of family members. And so even in the face of tremendous obstacles and hardships, they sent small gifts and correspondences 
and, co and contributions when they could. Spurred by an account of extreme need at home, they could sometimes make remarkable gestures of self-sacrifice. Moreover, the camp system itself at times acknowledged the legitimacy of this trend and specifically allowed such transfers, particularly in periods of acute shortage and mass dislocation. For instance, a secret police circular issued in January 1944 authorized inmates to send as much as half of the funds they had in their account, 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 accounts home to their relations. The examples of Gulag correspondence I've described here are interesting because they complicate our understanding of the basic mechanisms that govern Soviet society. And then we see that Sovietization was not always absolute. New members of Soviet society who were absorbed along with conquered territory in the 1940s, like Formakov and his wife, could seemingly learn to speak Bolshevik and yield to political pressure in some contexts, but then in others could display contradictory behavior. Poor uh, Soviet living conditions outside the camp, uh, camps, particularly in famine years and amidst the chaos of war, meant that Soviet inmates could legitimately fear that their loved ones were facing extreme deprivation and sometimes did try, as Lesutin did, to mail resources home, despite the fact that they were struggling or at the very least insecure themselves. An inmate in a relatively privileged position in camp, like Formakov and Lesutin, could at any moment be set to a ruinous hard labor assignment, felling trees outdoors, or to an undeveloped campsite in a remote location where inmates initially had no shelter whatsoever. When Lazutin sends his bride all his savings in 1946, he is risking everything. Despite all the pressure that Soviet citizens faced in their relationships, uh, we often see them taking tremendous risks and acting in seeming defiance of self-interest. Labor camp correspondence is a valuable resource in part because it allows us to see these choices play out in real time. Thank you. No, I'm happy to answer questions if you would like. Yeah. So, um, when inmates would die, would families back home receive letters uh, detailing that their relative or friend passed away, or is that just something that somebody's just best what they need for Not usually. In fact, um, although regulations are inconsistent and you will find contradictions in them, generally camps were discouraged from providing any information to uh, families about what had happened to a convict. So, um, you know, often having a correspondence break off. Not getting a response was how you figured out that something had gone wrong. Sometimes a merciful camp employee or a friend of the convict would write home and tell your spouse that you had died. <coughs> but often there was no word. That was very typical, right? Yeah? Among the like, well-established camps, what the mortality rate look like? Oh gosh, I am not a historian. I'm a lit person. So I'm not all good on the numbers, and I don't really like, I mean, debating death rates is a big thing in, in history of labor camps. It really is. But I'm not good at that debate, and I don't really play. What I will say is it really depended on the camps. Um, in some places, they really would um, dump you all in the middle of a field of snow with no tools and very limited supplies, a couple bags of grain, and tell you that your first assignment was building your own labor camp. If you're dumped like that in November with no warm clothing, right, um, can we expect a pretty catastrophic death rate? Yeah, I mean, you certainly were seeing death rates of approaching 40% in a single year during the worst periods of World War II and in the worst camps, right? That's true. Now, you know, but, but it varies a lot. In other periods, it was much lower. You were not seeing that kind of a high death rate consistently over time. They also liked to discharge people right before they died. That was a way. In principle, uh, Moscow did actually, it, it, they didn't care a lot for human life, but they did care for statistics. And so one of the, um, it, you know, some teachers have rubrics. One of the rubrics that the central ministries graded labor camps on was their mortality rate. So how well you kept your death rate down, despite the fact that you weren't getting the supplies you needed to adequately feed and clothe the inmates. So 
Um, if your death rate crime's too high, it's a problem. The inspectors will chew you out and say you're um, being derelict and you've done a bad job. So one of the ways to massage this, since it's a bad statistic, is that you weigh, when you have inmates who look like they're about to die, you quickly and preemptively release them. And there is a whole procedure for doing this. And that way they die outside the camp and they're not part of your statistic. Which is one reason I don't like fighting that war of statistics is because it, it's a little muddy. Any other questions? Yeah. So you said you're a litmus. What sparked your interest in this? What did you decide to research? Well, you know, my interests are always right on the edge between literature and history, right? Um, they always are. Um, when I was uh, in graduate school, um, I did, wrote an MA paper on the left Bolsheviks and the party school that they built on Capri at the house of Maxime Gorky. And I went to my advisor, um, Robert McGuire, um, uh, and said that it had occurred to me as I was writing this that it might look a lot like history, and perhaps I was in the wrong department. And he looked at me and said, yes, I can see why you would think that, but we'll be much nicer to you here. And so I stay, right? Um, um, I, I would say that what I take from literature is that I'm very interested in text, right? And I spend a lot of time working hard with text. And these letters are text too, right? Um, and just as if you're reading a novel, you can't take everything a character says as the gospel truth. We're supposed to think how reliable is that character? Is that a positive character or not? In the same way with my documents, I need to think, what did that person really mean to say here, right? Um, what were they trying? Are there some reasons why they might be fudging things, right? Um, some of you probably communicate regularly with your parents, and I'm sure that although you love your parents very much, there are moments where you fudge some details in those communications for a variety of reasons. Probably sometimes just to spare your mother grief, right? You may not tell her about a low chemistry grade on a test just because you don't want to agitate her right? Or about a bad day, or the fact that you were almost struck by a car. Because, you know, there are times when sharing that with mom is not necessarily helpful for anyone, right? And so, in reading a correspondence like this, I try to read it with that eye. And I think that in these circumstances, too, inmates are making choices. So we need to see these, these letters as communicative acts that were meant to convey something, right? And meet emotional needs, right? They're, they're trying to play a role in a relationship. But you can't just take it as an absolutely factual statement, right? You need to read sympathetically and thoughtfully as you're looking at the document. And for me, I guess that's, that's what I'm taking from my literature specialization. And how I found the topic was really I stumbled into it. I was working in an archive on a literature scholar by the name of Von Sifferoff. And I finally managed, after years of begging and crying, to get his personal papers from the Publichka, the public library in Petersburg. And I opened up this file. And there were hundreds of labor camp letters. And I thought to myself, are these forged? What is the deal? I had never heard of an inmate writing hundreds of letters. And so I got very interested in these big correspondences. And this idea, Solzhenitsyn tells us that the labor camp system was this gulag archipelago, this set of islands. And when I tell you that, you imagine that it is totally cut off from everything surrounding, right? But in fact, yes, it was cut off, but it was also really deeply connected with the rest of the Soviet Union in some very clear ways. And for me, this material really is uh, provocative partly because it forces us to recognize that we have really bought into that metaphor. It's a great metaphor. It's a fabulous metaphor, right? But it's not the full truth. It is, it is a metaphor. So, anything else? Yeah. So, I'm curious, I don't know if we have any information on this, but Letters went out through both official and unofficial channels. Yes. Do we have any indication of whether most inmates did receive letters and send letters, or was no, it you, a small percentage? Okay, well, see, now this is another thing. It's when we're thinking about the camp population, you need to think about the fact that, that a lot of different people ended up in camp. Mm -hmm. We hear a lot about the political prisoners who were literate, right, um, by mm -hmm. and large, exactly. writing home to their family members, right? Um, but uh, to be honest, um, the biggest population in the labor camps was, was peasants, right? Um, peasants. Now, t to some extent, of course, the Soviet Union achieved almost universal literacy at the, uh, in, uh, after the revolution. But that universal literacy was not the kind of literacy that makes you a person who reads great novels or spends a lot of time writing 12-page communications to your mother. 
It's the kind of literacy that has you signing documents, right? And may be able to kind of sort of complete a form. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So um, uh, were those peasants writing home to, to uh, their families? Not necessarily, right? That, so that's one thing. Um, so not all pe uh, prisoners. Um, you'll notice that I, the two prison correspondents that I'm talking about are from inmates who are desk jobs. And the truth is, it's incredibly hard to sustain a correspondence if you're at hard labor for a long period of time. I do have a lot of letters that were written by people who were at hard labor, but usually um, either those correspondences are very short or they move out of those jobs and into a desk job quickly, and that's the truth. If you're felling trees for 12 hours a day, right, out in a swamp, Right? Do you have the energy to write a letter when you get back to your barracks? And if you're felling trees, do you have access to paper and pens? Now, if you're the camp accountant, do you have paper and pens at your disposal? Do you have a quiet place to write a letter? So again, you know, I, I have isolated examples of correspondence from even criminals, common criminals, but that's what they are. Um, the big correspondences are by people who are educated and usually people who are in desk jobs for at least long periods of time. Anything else? Yeah. To get back to the earlier question about not informing relatives about the death of an inmate, um, was that part of a, an explicit policy like in Germany with the knock of the table where they, they did it as a kind of terror tactic? So well, that the population would be constantly insecure I, I don't know that I would say that. I mean, I would say that um, there are there are, there were two types of packages that are involved in labor camps and prisons. There is a pasilka, which is what you send someplace, right? You mail it, and then there's a pididacha, which is something that you hand in at the window. You physically deliver, right? And there are very elaborate instructions about um, both pasilki and pididachi, but. Particularly with the pirudach, the handing in, one of the basic rules is that if the inmate is, if the inmate has been executed, moved, anything has happened, died, you don't tell the family anything. You simply say he's not there, and that's all the information that you give them. Now, um, labor camp uh, rules were implemented very erratically. So if I say you're not supposed to give the family information, in principle, that was the business of registry bureaus. As an individual wife, you were supposed to write, write to your local registry bureau, which is you know, where you go if you wanted to get married or divorced, right? And since this arrestee was still connected with that local registry bureau, they were supposed to be able to tell you, although obviously they couldn't, right? It wasn't the business of the camps. Does that mean that individual camp employees sometimes went against regulations and did stuff? Sure, right? That, that did happen. But in principle, they weren't supposed to share the information. There was a big stink because um, a lot of people got sentences um, when the high purges were going on in 1937 of 10 years without um, uh, correspondence. It was a standard slogan. For a while, it was thought that that was a euphemism that always meant the person was shot. It turns out that some people really did get sentences of 10 years without the right of correspondence. But often, <coughs> that was a euphemism. Often it did mean the person had been had executed. So if you're a wife whose husband was arrested in 1937 and you were told his sentence was 10 years without the right of correspondence, what question are you asking in 1947? So. When's he coming home? So at that moment, the camp system and, uh, and the secret police actually had to get together and create falsified death certificates, and they began churning them out rapidly that would um, willy-nilly name a place, died of heart attack, and pull it out of the, right, in top, right? Um, and so one of the things that happened after Stalin died during the period of the Khrushchev Thaw is that the state went back and it had to admit that those were all lies and begin coming up with documents that were at least more accurately reflective of what probably happened. So this lack of information was more a bureaucratic snarl than a, than a real policy like in Germany? I mean, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's, do you want to be telling people we executed your husband? I mean, you know, I, I mean, I think there certainly was an attitude of, of hiding some of that. Um, but, but I don't know that I would say that the policy itself was designed to instill terror. If anything, I think the policy was designed to probably 
hide the dimensions of what was going on from the populace and keep people complacent. Because if I tell you your husband has a 10-year sentence, I, it's, theoretically I might still be hopeful that he'll come home, right? right? And I might not rebel. If I tell you I've shot him, then I have nothing to lose, right? I mean, I think there was an effort to kind of manage this horrible situation. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, yeah, and in that sense, it's a little bit similar to Germany because they were because by keeping the population un uncertain, they wouldn't do because they were afraid that they might they might cause yeah the death or torture of a loved one in, in jail. So That's right. It, yeah, so it, it is it did fill, fulfill some similar. Some. Well, and that's a reason for this too. The correspondence too can be seen as a way of managing morale, both in and outside of the camps, and convincing people that they might still have something to live for, theoretically, right? Oh, yeah? Yeah, I was just curious, how did Lazuzi have such, such amount of savings? <laughs> I, and then the second question I have, so you said that from a point was also an informant. So you got some information not only for his letters, but do you have access to their Okay, in terms of Lesutin, I think 500 rubles was actually not as much in the immediate post-war period as it sounds like because that's pre the big currency devaluation that takes place in, uh, when is it? I'm blanking, this is where I'm not a historian. But right, there's the big devaluation, but as a result, the numbers of money were inflated. That was really basically a one month income. So it's, I mean, it's true when we're thinking about the late Soviet period, that's more like three, four months income. So it sounds huge, right? Um, I, I, they were getting small payments for their labor in camp, right? They didn't always have something to spend it on necessarily, so that could pile up. He also was from a Moscow family that sent him rubles. So over time, he could build up a certain amount of money. Um, he, uh, I, I don't know. Who knows? Maybe he managed to borrow a little from free laborers. I have no idea. But I believe him when he says he sent her every dime he had. That makes sense to me, that he sent her every dime he had. And it's a heck of a gesture, right? Um, that uh, she was being courted by, uh, you, know, uh, you know, and there was this question, maybe you can get a better offer, right? On the one hand, it's right after the Great War, there are very few men left, right? This is a demographic period where you don't have so many choices um, as a recent camp releasee. But on the other hand, you know, um, should she look around? Her family members were encouraging her to look around. Now, he sure extends himself. He shows at that moment, I think that's very important, that he's fully invested in this relationship, right? But it is a huge risk. Now, in terms of the Formakov question, um, Formakov, there were some oddities in Formakov's um, uh, uh, case that stood out from the very beginning, um, right? Uh, for instance, when he was released in 1947, he was allowed to return to Riga, which is unusual. Riga is a capital of a republic. Usually, really, sees were banned from going back to that kind of a cosmopolitan environment. Um, you know, yeah, there's a huge discussion in the correspondence of where he's going to be sent. Um, so I was a little bit suspicious. Um, in Riga, I managed to invent to see his investigative files. So for both the 19. Um, 40 case and the 1949 case. I did not see his KGB informant files, which I was told at the time were still closed. It's something I'd like to go back and look at. Um, uh, but the 1949 case, when he's picked up again, he says, but I'm an informant. I've been going in, right, to report to my handler every two weeks. I have a nickname, right? I can't remember what it is, something like crazy, like Zimlinikin. Right? And, um, you know, uh, so there's this whole discussion of that, and it's in the file. The investigators say, true, in 1945, he signed on as an informant in camp. And given this whole back and forth, I tend to view that as absolutely clear. He was an informant, right? Um, so when I found this material, I discussed it with a major um, historian in Latvia who works on the Russian minority in Latvia, um, senior fellow, and he said, what are you going to do? I've been sitting on this information in, for 10 years. And I said, you know, and he said, well, I don't, I, you know, I don't know what Formakov gave out in the 1940 case. He clearly did not inform. He was not the major source of information on that case. Um, it's not clear how much good information he gave the authorities at any time. A lot of people in, were signed on as informants. Solzhenitsyn, 
signed the form in camp agreeing to be an informant. He says he gave no information, but he signed the form. 8% of camp inmates signed the form saying they'd serve as informants. Not all of them gave good information. A lot of them were kicked off the rolls eventually for not giving information. Informant Coast, uh, case, again, his return to Rika suggests that maybe he did give something. How much? I don't know. For me, not acknowledging it at all seemed to really, um, first of all, it would call anything I did into question later on when someone found it. It's just obvious in the file. And second of all, I think that we obscure some very hard realities about the Soviet Union when we lie about these things, when we pretend that everybody was a hero and that those informants were all bad people. That's a lie. The truth is what was really awful about that system was that good people, normal people, your neighbors, people who weren't horrible, who were pretty nice, well-intentioned people, were sucked in and made to inform because they had weaknesses. Formakov's weakness, he wanted to go home to his family. Interestingly enough, right before he signs on as an informant, he's unexpectedly moved to a logging detail where his health begins to fail. And he gets very ill and he almost dies. Well, gee, you know, I mean, that's a whole lot of leverage. I personally do not know if I were in a labor camp and I was facing those choices, if I would be such a perfect person and would never, ever sign that form. I can't say that. So I think acknowledging that, that people... Um, People were forced to do things in this period is, is really important and, and fair. The weird wrinkle with Farmakov is that he's one of Solzhenitsyn's original 50 informants who provided the core material that created the Gulag Archipelago, Solzhenitsyn's three-volume account of the labor camps. And if you look at recent editions, you will see that he is named by name, Arseniy Farmakov, Latvian inmate, right? Um, he had warm relations with Solzhenitsyn, casual but warm. There are letters from Solzhenitsyn in his um, archive. Uh, Solzhenitsyn would write to him and say, I'm coming to Riga. Can I park my car in your courtyard and leave it? Will anyone notice it if it's parked there for 24 hours? So you got to wonder, the real issue for me is not was he informing in the late 40s, was he informing in the 1960s? when he was dealing with Solzhenitsyn and when he was one of Solzhenitsyn's uh, witnesses. That's much more the issue. Any other questions? If they were informants in the camp, does that mean informing on other prisoners? Or? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, again, it's, it's like the horrible things, I mean, in terms of um, uh, East Germany, right? Um, it's the same sort of thing. Were there a lot of informants in the Soviet Union during the Stalin period, right, particularly, but even in the post-Stalin period, looking at a room like this, I would have to assume that at least a handful of you were active informants reporting to the KGB um, contact in our department. Every department had one, and I would assume that five of you would be going and reporting on the content of this lecture. It was a known fact, and you had to operate with that assumption in all situations. And in a labor camp barracks, you have the same thing. You need to assume that some of the inmates are actively reporting, right? Your apartment building, there's someone who is reporting to the authorities on you. That is how it worked. For children and their parents. Yes. Yes, this is, an, this is a situation, and that's the other thing, when Formakov writes super orthodox letters to his children, where he lists for his son Dmitri all the great Dmitris in Russian history, one after another, right? Part of that, too, is um, five-year-olds. Anyone spend time with five-year-olds? Are they very careful about what they say? Can they say the darndest things in public in a way that really... Right? I simply blurt out family truths that don't need to be really voiced. Now just imagine this in a fraught political situation. Do you want your five-year-old to have any idea of any drama that is going on in the family? Or do you want him to live in a sunny world of Komsomol meetings and famous Dimitris from Russian history? Anything else? Thank you so much. Thank you.